Lock it up, very quiet and still. Ready. Scene one, take three, A mark. We are here with David Sullivan. Hi. Thank you for being here. Yeah, no, thanks for having me. This is cool. You look nervous right now. I am so nervous. I'm so nervous because I, I know I've I had so many friends who have podcasts and they've all asked me to do it. And uh, it's so revealing and so vulnerable and it scares me. <laughs> so, but this is the year that I've been leaning into things that scare me. I got asked to do a play. I'd never done a play before. I was like, yes, I will do a play. It scares the shit out of me, but I will do it. Yes, I'll do the podcast finally. So thank, thank you. Me. Thank you for uh, having us be the inaugural. Absolutely. Uh, but you're not a podcast guy, though. Do you listen to that? I know I don't. I because all, all of my friends have them, and I just I well think brag it, about it. Yeah, Fancy well, I mean, but also like they, you know, they, 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 in the beginning it's like, oh, who can we get? Who can we get? And they just ask all their friends, and I'm like, ah, I, don't, I don't know if I'm going to do that. So, but then if I listen to all my friends' podcasts, then it'd be like I'd have no time in the day. But I do listen. I have listened to a couple of the crime podcasts. Okay. Like uh, the Serial, I blazed through that one, and and a few of the other ones because there's just so much crime out there. Um, <laughs> and I feel like a crime fighter when I listen to them because like, wait, what about the glove that they mentioned in episode two? Um, but you solved yeah. any mysteries lately? I, you know, I I, uh, I haven't called in yet. There's uh, like some tip lines where you can call in, but I haven't done that yet. Yet. Yeah. Yeah. But it's gonna come. It'll come. Gonna come. I'm gonna crack the case. So here's where I want to start with you. Yeah. When I think about David Sullivan and I think about a guy coming from pretty small town, Texas, mm -hmm. and I think about how I ended up here, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's like San Francisco to theater school to here. And I yeah. think we've arrived at a similar place through totally, totally different ways. So yeah. how talk to me about how you ended up as an actor. Well, it's I, yeah, I'm from a really small town and um, well, it's small for Texas, like 70,000 people. But it feels smaller because the high school that I went to, I graduated with 75 people. So like and my dad was like part of the 10th graduating class and he graduated with like 13 people or like whatever it was. So I just kind of felt like I'm in a small town. Um, so I played sports growing up. Uh, arts wasn't really a thing. Um, and then my junior year. Uh, I was dating a uh, I was dating a, um, a girl who was older. She was a senior, and she was in the play. And she was like, "Hey, you know that um, if you audition for the play and get a part, then on Fridays, like we get to go to like competitions, and we only have half days." And I'm like, H "Half days? Uh, yeah, yeah, let's do that." So I auditioned for this play. It was uh, called. It actually, it was a one act play. So it was called "You Can't Take It With You." Oh, and, I know you can't take it with oh, you. Oh, okay, great. Oh, yeah. So, uh, and I auditioned uh, to be a grandpa. And so I talked like with a voice like this, and I got the part. Like, granted, there weren't that many people trying out for the play, but I got the part, and like my girlfriend was already part of the cast. And then, like, a couple other like football player buddies of mine were in the cast because they heard the same news. It's like, wait, we get a half day. So I'm going to join. So I did that, and I won like awards. And I was like, oh, man. Maybe I'm good at this. And uh, and then so senior year rolled around and we had another one act. This is like an 11 minute play. We do the whole play in like 11 minutes, I feel like. Or maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just one act. Like an of abridged the play. version of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, very it's much so. It's so funny you're saying you played the grandpa because I saw that on Broadway two years ago. Do you know oh. who played the grandpa? No. James Earl Jones. Oh, wow. And so just the idea of imagining you yeah. and Darth Vader playing yeah. the same part is oh, wow. just that's awesome. Cr that's to amazing. Me. Yeah, I, I did that. And then my senior year, I did uh, Harvey. Um, which uh, it was um, uh, it was a play about a guy who saw a seven foot white rabbit and uh, and and yeah I won awards for that and then I got I got like a scholarship offer to go to a junior college to to pursue the play or I got an invitation to walk on at Baylor and play football and I was like well obviously I'm gonna play football at Baylor so I went to Baylor walked on the football team I what position? Kick, kicker. We didn't have to go into that, but dang it. Yeah, kicker. It's vulnerable, yeah, man. Yeah, it is vulnerable. Um, so I was a kicker at Baylor for a couple seasons, and then Matt Bryant transferred in, and he's been kicking in the NFL for the past 17 seasons, so I didn't have a shot at that. Um, but yeah, I, I so after college, I moved to Dallas. I, I was working at a tech company. Uh, I got laid off five months later. I was a little sad. I was a little depressed. And How old are you at this point? I was 21, 22. And, uh, and yeah, I, I didn't really know what depression was like it was, you know, being where I'm from, it's just like, uh, we'll, we'll chill out or like, uh, think of something happy. Like, no, we don't have time to be depressed. So 
I, uh, I thought about well, what makes me happy. I joined a flag football team. I was part of a, 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 bas- a rec basketball team. I was doing all the sports, and sports were making me happy. But I was like, man, what do I really want to do? And I remembered how good I felt on stage. And I was like, is that even a possibility? So I got on a local website in Dallas, and it was like basically like Craigslist um, uh, in Dallas. And I was just like looking for acting jobs. And uh, there was this there was this thing with hair where they were doing like an industrial thing where they were combing people's hair for like a hundred bucks, and I was like, I'll do that, and I got it. You got I great had, hair. I had great hair at the time. Uh, and then there was an indie movie that was shooting in Dallas, and uh, and I was like, oh yeah, I gotta send in a picture. So I I mailed. This was back in the old days where I, I had a picture and I mailed it in. And the was guy, it black and white? It was black and white, yeah. Beautiful. Black and white picture. I mailed it in, and uh, which I had gotten in New York during college because I would gotten an internship uh, at Lehman Brothers, oddly enough, in New York uh, the summer before 9-11. Co- completely different story. But um, I was there, and they needed extras for a movie, and I was like, I have acting experience. I can do that. And so I went. I was cramped yeah, You yeah. can't take it with Exactly, you. exactly. So I was like, oh, I can do that. So I had somebody take my picture, and so I used that same picture, black and white, like headshot. And uh, so, yeah, I met with uh, Shane uh, Carruth, the writer-director of uh, Primer, and we just met kind of like in a, in a small place like this. It was just a little room, essentially, and we were, like, reading. He gave me a couple pages to read, which I, now we know are sides. And I read it, and he asked me what I was doing tomorrow, and I was like, ah, dude, I just got laid off. I'm not really doing much. I was like, let's read some more stuff tomorrow. And I was like, okay, which was a callback. I didn't know it was called that. Um, so I read some st- more stuff with him the next day, and uh, – and then he was like, well, I got a guy who's going to run a camera. Do you know anything about filmmaking? And I'm like, no, I don't. Um, I, I, just, I just graduated and I was working at this software company. And um, he was like, all right, well, uh, yeah, we're going to try to shoot for you know, the next 38 days, whatever it was. And, and, um, and I said, okay, great. And so, yeah, I got two, two buddies of mine that from college who were in multimedia. So they knew a little bit about cameras. Um, so they helped out. They were part of the crew. That was Jack Pylan and, and uh, Casey Gooden, who's now was a producer and has produced both of Shane's movies. Um, and uh, yeah, we made Primer for seven grand, and it took like two years to edit it and uh, do all the like sound and foley, and um, which I had already gone back to work. I was working for uh, AT and T Wireless at the time, and he calls me around Thanksgiving. He's like, "Hey, David," and I was like, "Shane." I hadn't spoken to forever. Um, and he was like, uh, Primer got into Sundance. And I was like, uh, what, did, can I go? Did you know what Sundance was? I, I knew what it was. I knew like Robert Redford, like that was the thing. But like, I would, I'd be lying if I say I didn't look it up after that. I was like, wait, does, does that mean I can go to this thing? Like, it's a festival, but what does it mean? It's just a party? Like, I really didn't know much about it. Um, but yeah, I talked my brother into going with me and two of my best friends from college. And, uh, yeah, I mean it, it 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 wasn't that fun because we didn't <laughs> we didn't have anybody famous in the movie. Like it was just me and Shane and then my friends who everybody who was a part of the the crew, which was the five of us, was also in the movie. So like and every scene that we shot, everything on camera with the exception of like 2 minutes is in the movie. Like we shot a wide, we used the wide. Um, we're like, all right, we got it. Um, we, we would shoot, sometimes we would shoot the line and then whip over and shoot the other line. So it was like, we, we didn't really know what we were doing, but we were also like, well, all we needed to do is get, make sure we cover the dialogue. So, um, so yeah, my, my buddies came out there with me. We didn't have anybody famous. Like we tried to get into parties and we couldn't get in. we're like, we're one of the 16 films in competition. Like we have to, like, where's the, do we need credentials? Like what? So it was, wasn't that great. Um, uh, I did go skiing, which was fun. And then on the last day, like it got weird because we knew that we, cause we spent seven grand on this movie and we knew that, that we were one of the front runners for the Alfred P. Sloan award, which is like a $20,000 cash prize. And I was like, I think we got a shot at winning this. And then Shane was like, I think we actually did win it. So I think we're all kind of going to this award show. And so like uh, when he said we all, what I didn't understand was that what he meant was him and his brother and his parents. And there might be a seat for me uh, because he only had like four, four ga- or three guests. Um, so I brought my brother and my buddies and like, we get there and they were like, um, so we have room for you, but you guys are gonna have to sit in the overflow, but yeah, come on in, come on in, come on in. And they were so sweet to me. And, but Shane and I weren't even sitting together. And, uh, and then it wins like Danny Glover's up there with Maggie Gyllenhaal 
and they they're like and the the winner for best feature or, or uh, the grand jury prize this film created a new language this film really reminds us of what independent cinema is all about and th this film really has kind of changed and I'm we just kind of start looking at each other because we had seen almost all the films and it was like wait a second is it changing the language like what this? and then they said primer and like we were just kind of out of our minds. I wish everyone could see your face right now. Oh. I feel like it's exactly. It was the same what, place. It's yeah. sa what's this, this, the face that I'm making right now? I was on the cover of USA Today the following day, w making that same face. <laughs> I'm on stage and Shane is at the podium, like giving a speech, and I'm just like, oh, and my eyes are wide open and my hands are on my head, and uh, I still have that somewhere. Um, but yeah, it wins Sundance, and then I'm a movie star. In my mind, I'm like, I'm a movie star. Okay, so let's go back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to unpack yeah, some of this. Yeah, stuff. yeah, yeah. So going back to the audition. For yeah. this, um It's been a little bit since I've seen that movie now. Yeah. But what I remember is that it, part of the fun of it yeah. is that you don't know what the movie's about no. until it kind of reveals itself. Right. And these guys are talking very opaquely. Right. Like you're not supposed to get it. Right. How much did you have any idea what the fuck you were reading? Nothing. I, did, I had no idea. I mean, when, uh, the, 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 the audition was basically friends sitting around a table. And and they're talking about which is actually, uh, I think it's the opening. Isn't it the it's opening not, of the movie? It, yeah, it's it's there's a there's a small beginning of them walking around the garage and stuff and a, and a little voiceover. But I remember the audition being the opening uh, scene or the the next scene. Did you guys shoot it kind of like that Reservoir Dog scene where it just kind of goes around? Is yeah, right? well, well, no, that we mainly this was so in the garage we used a, a dolly and we covered like all four people's dialogue in one shot. But at the first, um, in, at the table, we had a really high camera, which almost kind of seemed like security footage. We were up on a ladder and shooting down on us. And then we just had another um, camera over here, uh, uh, another shot uh, kind of behind me. And it just kind of dollied around to get the other two guys' um, uh, lines. But basically, yeah, we... Um, uh, uh, yeah, that was the that was the audition, and so how did you? Prepare I didn't prepare. At this I, point? I, like, well, what, that was, was the thing. acting to There you? was no like email. I didn't get the email, and I I didn't. Uh, he gave me the pages when I got there, and it was it was basically a, a two page scene, and uh, and there were four people in the scene, and I was like, wait a second, uh, I'm gonna pretend that other guy's here and that other guy's here. So I I got one of the I got a piece of paper and I wrote out uh, Phil and I pointed that way. Um, and then I wrote out, uh, I'm blanking on the other characters' names. There was only four of us, but I forgot. Uh, Robert. And that way. So I knew to look that way when I was talking to Philip, and I knew to look that way when I was talking to Robert, and I knew to look this way when I was talking to Abe, because at the time I was actually auditioning for Aaron, which was the director's part. Um, and yeah, I just basically kind of read and kept my connection with, with Shane, the writer director who was also auditioning me, also reading that part. And, I don't know. I think it was maybe the lack of understanding. Uh, like, I didn't know that I had to, because I'd just gotten it. Well, you're not trying to make anything precious. No. You're not trying to do no. something with it. No. Were you good at connecting to people? Uh, yeah. That's one thing that I, I feel like i Is that I'm your always, superpower as like a kid? I think kinda? so. I think so. And and I, I, get, I get such a good energy boost when I'm really connecting with people. And I really feel like we're both changing a little bit in a way when we really allow ourselves to experience that connection. Um, and I, I didn't really recognize that till later on. I didn't really recognize like, and it wasn't until like five, six years ago where I actually called myself a good actor because I was like, I'm just lucky. Like I, I did a movie and it won Sundance. Like I'm just lucky. Like I'm not that great. But then I realized that like, no, I have this, I have this ability where I can connect to a story and really live in that story really quickly and then connect with, the person reading across me from the audition or the person in class or whatever, the person I'm coaching. And I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm really good at that. Um, and I think that's when I became a much better actor because I was okay saying I'm good at this. And for the longest time I was like, I don't I mean oh, the, the, my, and I remember my dad's in my head was like, yeah, the best actors in Hollywood are living under bridges. Like you don't, you, you, you don't have a guaranteed job in, in Hollywood if just cause you're the best actor, you just gotta be so full of luck. And, my dad wasn't the the biggest supporter of but me. But isn't both things true? Yes. Because I think people do need luck. Yes. I think this oh, idea absolutely. That, oh, like, absolutely. Talent always wins out is oh, utter no, bullshit. No, no, for sure. In fact, if you had to pick, yeah, between being lucky oh, yeah. or being talented, mm -hmm. 
I mean, God, that's a horrible choice. But in theory, I think you picked the luck. Yeah. Well, the thing, what I always think is luck will get you a job, but the talent will give you a career. Because I've seen people be really lucky and get like, what? She got that job or he, whoa, that is going to make him like, that's amazing. And then like, they're like, wait, now what do I do for the next thing? Like, I don't have the luck anymore. And like, or, or I don't have the lucky person who gave me that job or whatever it was. And, but now I don't necessarily have the talent or the skill or put in the work. So I'm kind of in a weird place. So I feel like you need both. Um, again, the talent is and the work and the preparation is what gives you that longevity. I think luck will, can give you a shot. Um, but you have to have the other stuff to, to, to keep a career, you know? So you said your dad was not that into it. Well, he just, I think he was just scared. He was just, he didn't want me because I had a college degree and like I, my brother was, was like at the time he was working for Goldman Sachs and he was like a, a junior vice president. And like my sister had, had, um, she, she kind of, she was a theater teacher and, and she really embraced the arts and she was really pushing me. She was like, go for it, go for it. And she's eight years older than me. Um, and my mom was like, go for it, go for it. But you know, your dad, you're just like, ah, just, I, I, I don't want dad to be disappointed, but I think he was just scared. He was afraid that I would move to LA and not make it. And, and he knew, yeah, he just knew how sad that would make me. And, and like, but it, it's funny because any time I would talk to him on the phone, he, he passed away six years ago last week. Um, I think about him a lot, but, um, anytime I talk on the phone without fail, I'd sometimes put it on speakerphone and let my, my friends here, he would say, well, uh, um, you know, if if, if uh, uh, I miss you, but if, if it doesn't work out, you know, your brother can always get you on at the bank. Like he's always like years later, he always was, said, you know, you can come back home and go to the bank and you're not a failure, which I just heard. Was it uh, Will Arnett uh, said something the other day about his dad? His dad was a musician and Will, n- not Will Arnett, Will Ferrell. Um, can't believe I just got those mixed up. Uh, but his dad had saying, look, if, if you don't make it like you can always do something else. And so that gave him the freedom to like take that leap. Um, but yeah, he, he, after, you know, after I was, I was on TV and the movie and stuff, like he was carrying pictures around me in his checkbook and he would show people. So he uh-huh. eventually came around. Yeah. It was pretty cool. So yeah, that's how I, that's how I ended up here. So primer wins. Yeah. What happens to you immediately after that? Are you getting calls from agents right away? Well, you would think like you would think I, I, would. I, 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 but, but it's, it's not a commercially, successful movie i mean it's not it's not a movie that you can just put into a theater and make lots of money so like it's a real artsy movie um at sundance i did meet a few people and i i they were like you got to meet so and so and so and so so i quickly signed with a a pretty big manager i mean at the time they were like we have ashton kutcher and we developed him and like we have you know all these people and i was like okay cool so i signed with a big manager um and i quickly learned that I was just going out for huge movies that I had no business being the lead of these movies. And I didn't have experience. Um, the audition I had wasn't really even an audition. It was just me reading with a guy who had written the material. So, like, I went into probably 20 auditions, and I was horrible. Just horrible. And then there was this one. It was Friday Night Lights that um, I was like, oh, this is Texas. This is a football player. This is, I, this is me. This is my role. And so I did really well with that one. And, um, and Julie Hutchinson, I think was her name. She was the head of casting at Universal. Um, I flew back twice to have meetings, and I thought I was going to get that movie. And I was like, oh, okay, this is my movie star moment. Didn't get it. And, uh, yeah, like four or five months goes by, and I'm just bombing audition after audition. And I was like, I, is this where I go back home? Um, is this where I go back to the bank? Yeah, this is where I go. Yeah, my brother can get me on at the bank. Um, and then uh, this girl that I'd met uh, at a at a bar down the street, she was like, "Where do you work?" And I'm like, oh, "I'm an actor. I, you know, I don't, I don't work. I don't work." She was like, "But like, how do you make money?" And I'm like, uh, "Well, I just told you I was. Well, yeah, I don't make money acting. Um, but yeah, I, I do kind of need a job." So she just she was quitting as a hostess at this restaurant on the promenade, and uh, so I started hosting at this restaurant on the promenade, and it was horrible. Standing there for five hours outside. And there's a huge clock uh, tower where I would just literally look at the clock, and I was like, "What is what is wrong? What is going on in my life?" And uh, and yeah, I had some people recommend that I should take acting classes, and I'm like, "What am I not good enough?" I like I, my movie, but I just had a huge chip on my shoulder. So my first year was was awful. It was awful. And uh, and in that year, not to get sidetracked, but I had met a girl 
we had dated. She moved back to the East Coast. Uh, I found out that I was having a kid. I moved to the East Coast for a few months. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing with this acting thing. And then I got a, a request to like tape myself for this Jesse James movie, which Casey Affleck and Assassination yeah, 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 by yeah. the Coward Robert. Yeah, Ford. yeah, God, yeah. What a title. And I was like, Oh no, I still got it. Like they still want me. Um, and then I got an audition for um, Big Love, and so I f- I came back and I ended up getting that part. And I had the job as the host, so I was making a little bit of money. And I think right around that time, uh, one of the servers quit. So I had like two shifts as a server. So I was like, okay, well, I can, I can sustain. Um, and then, yeah, they were like, you got to try an acting class. And that's where I met John. Um, and so I met John and I don't know, I was in class for a year maybe. And then I was recommended to start teaching. And I was like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And they were like, you get it. And I was like, I don't know if I do. What do you think you learned in that year? Like, obviously lots of things. But if you could could say, you know, the the big lesson was. Um, Stay with it. I mean, I I had every opportunity to go back home. I had every opportunity to move to Massachusetts. I had every opportunity to to say, oh, I'm a a dad now. Like, I'm a family guy. I got to do this. Um, But there was just something something pulling me in the right direction. I didn't feel like I was pushing a boulder up a mountain. I just felt like what was right for me was at the top of the mountain and it was just like pulling me up. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to keep going in that direction. So I had this blind faith that like I led a movie once and I got nominated for an independent spirit award. Like I, I know how to do this. I have to have the confidence and the, uh, I guess the determination to kind of see it through. And I was like, I'm going to give myself four years because that's how long it would be if I went to med school or whatever. And then it seemed like every four years I'd get a big job. So I'd say I'd give it four more years. And like right around the four-year mark, I got Argo. And it was like, oh, okay, Ben Affleck, ben Affleck likes me? All right, cool. Yeah, I, I, maybe, maybe I'm pretty good at this. So there were all these little, little signs of validation where I was like, maybe I am good at this. And like my teacher telling me that you should teach and then – you know, I have one class and then I have two classes and I have three classes and I'm just like, and then I'm coaching all day and I'm like, whoa, like I, I am pretty good at this. But then I started thinking, well, maybe I'm just a good coach uh, or a good teacher. Um, but I didn't feel like that was my path. I felt like that was giving me my education because I didn't have the education. And John taught me that like you, 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 you teach what you need to learn and which I was like, that makes absolutely no fucking sense. And I was like, wait, no, that makes so much sense. And I found myself teaching. And that's why I love sitting in on your class so much because you're such a good teacher. And I feel like I learned so much from just like sitting next yeah, to you. Um, so, yeah, I'm kind of getting off, tr- off track. But, uh, yeah, the teaching and, and I guess that. Well, so let me ask you something yeah. about this. So how much now when you do your work, mm-hmm. when you're getting those audition sides and you're reading a screenplay or whatnot, how much of that, like, uh, quote unquote, traditional acting homework are you doing? Are you still breaking things down? No, I don't. Cause like, I don't hear you talk about my want. No, my, like I, it'll come up sometimes, well, but well, because in all honesty, I was never taught that I was, I was taught the, my first, I, I mean, even when I was on stage in high school for, you know, 11 minutes, like none of that was ever discussed. Like it was all about, this is your daughter. This is your best friend. It was all about relationships. And so I'm really good at kind of getting people to check in with like, you know, what, 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 how is she looking at you right now? What did she just say to you? Like, what noise did you just hear? Like, you have to be authentically planted in those given circumstances in that moment to be present and to be to to authentically tell that story so like when you say that i I just i got a little nervous and i got goosebumps right now because i'm like oh shit i I don't really know how to explain that verbiage i know what a one is but but like an intuition i guess it is intuition it is intuition and i don't know how to teach it because i honestly never really like officially learned it you know i didn't learn about substitute and like with the meisner technique like i i never did that i didn't and it made me so nervous i think the first time that I saw it I was sitting in on your class and I saw it and I got nervous I was like is that guy gonna punch that guy (laughs) and I was like oh my god oh my god it's actually so nervous um 
but there was like an authentic exchange of energy for sure. But like as a teacher and as somebody who's supposed to like be guiding these people, I'm like, oh my God, I'm scared. I don't know. So I've never done that in my class. I've never done a rep. God, I almost never do it either. Oh, oh, but the first time I saw it, I was just like, holy shit, this makes me nervous. And so like the acting games and like the warm ups and stuff, I, I don't really know what they do. I know they kind of get you in a playful mood, but I, I just don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know what those things do. Uh, so when you say like the traditional things, we may have to cut this out because I sound like a fucking idiot. No. Um, I think you sound honest. Oh, okay, right okay, now. okay. I, but I like this because I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest. I think those things can help people, but okay, the, I don't think they make people into actors. Yeah. I think almost all of it. I think an objective is like a check engine light. Yes. It's, oh, that's good. It's like uh, the scene's not working. Yeah. Do I know why I'm here? Mm -hmm. um, or like the scene is flabby or mm. flaccid, just yeah. not going anywhere. Well, then some of those technicals can all of a sudden spark something. Yeah. But you can have somebody write you a damn fine paper on how they should act a scene. And yeah. then it could be the most boring yeah. thing in the entire world. Right. And just not authentic. Because right. people, people walk into rooms wanting things, but they don't go into a room saying, I want this. Yes. They know it. Yeah. But they, they, it's not on manual. Right, 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 right. We right, often right. teach it. And I think right. of, often what we're doing is giving those as tools to get to what you're talking about. Yes. Which is some kind of intuitive relationship some intuitive understanding of what to do with this yeah stuff. and tell me if i'm wrong but i also think in a really wonderful way you are kind of looking to tickle yourself oh for sure like if like if you're bored by it, oh you're done oh absolutely absolutely that's both when i'm doing the scene and when i'm watching somebody else do the scene if i'm bored by it the first thing i'll do is i'll look around the room and like i'll see if everybody else is bored and then when i get like two or three people looking at me i'm like okay it's not just me like people <laughs> want me to stop this scene because something's not working um so yeah i have to and, and whenever i teach class usually at the end of each class i'm like thank you guys for entertaining me because like i really do get such entertainment um out of watching people put up a, a good scene and just doing good work and leaving it all out there and and what makes me even more excited is when i give them a small note or just a little tweak and they take it and they run with it and they make it their own. I'm like, oh, that just lights me up. It just, and, and it encourages me to like dig deeper my own work. Like when I do get my sides, um, I'll, I'll run through it and I'll really focus on my listening and, and, and I don't focus on my line so much. I focus on what the other pe person is saying and I have to really check in with the point of view that my character has and make sure I'm listening from that place. And then when I feel like I'm listening from that place, I try to tighten it even more and really find specificity and 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 how and how I'm listening and how I can how I can respond. And then when I go in the room, a lot of times I'm like, wow, that's not even what I worked on. But I was listening from such a, a, a specific place that I got something else from from the casting director. And, and it gave me it gave me freedom to respond in a different way. So I'm a little reckless when I go into when I, when I go into auditions because I haven't done all that work. But that's not a lack of preparation. Mm. No, that's it's not. That's true. Because that's, that's reckless yeah. to me. Reckless yeah, yeah, yeah. is going in and being like, I got nothing. Right. But I know my biggest pitfall as an actor by far is the fact that I, I'll i cling to the homework I did yeah. too much. Where it's like, well, no, no, no. But it's this. Yeah. It's this. And yeah. that's not how any human actually yeah. interacts. So that's not how you connect with a human. You don't right. tell them that they're wrong. Right. I want to go back. You said uh, listening through the point of view of the character. We mm -hmm. talk a lot about point of view. I think often people don't actually know what it means because mm -hmm. um, it can be such a overarching thing. Sure. Or, or what is your point of view about this one thing? Right. And, and how do I know if I have my point of view? Right. How do you feel like you lock into that? Well, I, I start with the breakdown and I see what the because sometimes the breakdowns are written by the casting directors. Sometimes they're written by the directors. Sometimes they're written by the writers. Um, I look at the breakdown and I'm like, OK, somebody in pow in a position of power has described this character this way. So I need to I need to focus on all these words and all these descriptions of the character that this person has in place but then I have to go read the script um, and I'm not skimming through just to look at my scenes I have to read the script to understand the tone and the direction of, of the film or the the show or whatever and then I have to understand my my role in this and sometimes it can be really small and uh, and and but it, it doesn't lack my purpose and so I guess I start I start with my purpose and I'm like okay what's my purpose in this movie like why have they written this character and and how does he see the world? So let's use can we use a specific yeah, one? Yeah, can yeah, we talk yeah. about flaked? Yeah. So you recur oh, yeah. two seasons. Yeah. Two seasons of that show working yeah. with Will Arnett, the yeah. series regular. Yeah. Um I feel like it's also booking a Netflix show when that's 
the coolest thing to book because yeah. like House of Cards was a big deal Orange is the New yeah. Black is a big deal but the idea that we're all streaming all the time yeah. that there was something really sexy about right, that right? right so tell me how did you feel like you figured out this guy's point of view or how he listens yeah well Dennis it, it was funny because like I had just had a, a big meeting it, I wouldn't say nasty meeting with my manager but it was like as every actor who comes to LA, we don't audition enough. We could audition 10 times a week and it's not enough because we haven't gotten the jobs. I had, I had auditioned like once in like four months and I'm like, I don't know what's happening. What do I need to do? And so they at the time were producing a show called Flaked. And my management company was producing it because my manager, um, or my managers, the guy that my manager worked for repped Will Arnett. Um, and so there was this role as this um, coffee shop owner uh, who had uh, who, who had anger issues, and his name was Stefan, and I had just grown my beard out because I usually either grow my hair out or my beard out in between roles. So if you ever see me with a, a long beard, it's because I haven't worked in a while or long hair, I haven't worked in a while. Um, <laughs> or the character uh, has one of those too. Um, and I, his point of view was so clear. Um, basically, he's, uh, well, I guess, how do I do it? I, I, uh, I guess with Stefan, uh, and I'm going to get to Dennis in just a second. But Stefan owns, he was a small business owner, and things aren't going right. They were, in, they were installing his sink. Um, they did it backwards. Uh, somebody else comes in and like questions his sobriety, and he's just had a day. And uh, so I knew from the get go. I mean, I, I went in with a, a, a big hipster hat. I'd shaved off my beard and I, I curled my mustache up because, uh, like, I was like, this is how. I guess for me, it kind of starts with the look as well. I have so many clothes. I, I wear the same clothes all the time, but I, I have so many clothes in my closet because I feel like once I find the guy's, like, his wardrobe, it's like, oh, I can get in that. And so I had a big dumb hat. I had I had a dumb, uh, must, oh, I shouldn't say dumb. It was a, a different than what I'm used to. Um, mustache, curled it up. And I... I thought I pissed off casting. I went in there and guns a blazing. Like I was like, fuck this, these fucking guys and this fucking thing. And I was yelling and everything. And I, and they were like, all right, thank you very much. And I walked out of the room and I was like, man, I don't even think I said hi. I think I just went in there and I was like, hey, what's up? Um, and I think it was a lot. It was a lot. The fact that I hadn't auditioned in, in months. Um, it was that the only thing I could audition for was a show that my manager was producing. Um, at the time, uh, Stefan wasn't a regular. Um, I just had a lot going on that, t uh, that day. And I went in there and I didn't hear anything for like two weeks. And then I called my manager and I was like, Hey, can you just check in with casting? I think I pissed somebody off. Like I, I went in there hot. I was running real hot that day. And, uh, and she was like, yeah, we'll check in. And they checked in and she called me back and said, so they want to see you for Dennis, the, the, the Will Arnett's best friend. And I'm like, huh? What? Uh I mean, yeah, of course they do. Of course they do. Um, so yeah, I, I, um, I, I, yeah. And Dennis just seemed, he seemed so, so laid back. And like, I lived in Venice when I, when I moved from LA, I lived in Venice and I just felt like I knew that culture. I felt like I knew that vibe. I went in there with like cut off shorts on. I had some khaki pants. I cut them off. Well, I still wear those all the time, but they're like cut off khakis. I went in there with flip flops, um, and I realized I don't really wear shorts to auditions very much. Um, and when there were flip flops, uh, my my beard had kind of grown back a little bit. And uh, and yeah, I just I walked in there and, and Anna had the confidence like they wanted to see me for this role. Um, and so that helped. Uh, this is a long way to answer your question. Um, but I think it just starts with understanding where the guy comes from and understanding, like you said, his want. I guess that's something that I do intuitively without actually saying, okay, what is his want? I just have to know where he comes from and I have to know like where he's going. Well, I guess that is his want and, and, and what he wants in order to get there. And so, yeah, I, I did three scenes of that and I was like, man, that felt pretty good. So if you go back to the point of view though, yeah. Dennis, is the point of view as simple as Venice or is the point of view he's chill? Or yeah, is that, or is there something more what? specific or layered? Or yeah, I, I think it starts with I think it starts with w uh, the story that they're trying to tell around Dennis. Like, okay, I knew that that he was a, a, a sommelier, 
And it's like that tell that's information to me. I'm like, okay, this guy is a is a is a former alcoholic. He's an alcoholic who's who's going to meetings, but he's he's a sommelier. So he he feels like he has this sort of control. And so like he there are times where he like has to feel in control. But he also are you he, saying sommelier? So what did I say? Sommelier. No, I the was, wine the wine yes, expert. Yeah, I just want to double check. Yeah. At first I heard sommelier. Sommelier. And I was like, what is a right. smell? Is that like an alcoholic term that I right. don't know about? Right, 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 no, right. that's fascinating, right. man. Right. Know right. what a sommelier is? Okay, so right. he's a sommelier who's, who's sommelier. in AA. Yes, in AA. So this is a guy who's going to pour drinks and recommend drinks for people, exactly. even though he can't do it himself. Exactly. Gotcha. And so that gives me a piece of his point of view. He lives in his guest house, and he rents out his main house. Like that gives me some of his point what of do view. What you learn like, from that? Tell me more. Well, it's just like he doesn't. So that is like okay. I know. I know a way where I can do. The, the maybe the least amount of work and have like the maximum benefit like I don't I don't actually have to work be a sommelier all the time like I can just like go sell wines to people because I don't have to cover my rent because somebody else is paying for that um, and there's 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 a story where like um, he likes this girl and so he goes and talks to her but then will like will like uh, or, or chip like comes in and like you know takes him away from her so like He's not. He's not the most. Um, he doesn't really stand up for himself. Like he. Um, he kind of sees sees the world as like you know. And his, he doesn't have a, a great relationship with his mom. Like she kind of has taken advantage of him. And like guy to guy. So all of these things in the story they create the point of view for me, and I just have to be willing to understand what it is and then live in that. And Dennis was very low status. And like at the time. When I I'm getting it, I'm getting this job and like I'm the 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 lead in the next Netflix show off, opposite Will Arnett. Like I had all the confidence in the world and I had all the status in the world, but I had to like keep my point of view in check and be like, wait a second, I'm I I don't have the status that David has. Like I have to really check. I have to really like check in and see where Dennis is right now. And a lot of times I would sit by myself on set and like people would talk to me and I I wouldn't really engage in conversation. Like I would kind of. And it's so funny because like towards the end of the first season, I started getting so comfortable with being kind of the lackey or whatever that I started forgetting my lines and like screwing up takes because I started doubting. I, I had such low status that somewhere it started creeping into David's mind. And I was like, wait, maybe I'm maybe I shouldn't be here. Maybe I'm not good enough to be here. And like it was tough. It got it got to a point to where they called my manager and they were like they were like, hey, is everything OK with David? And then my manager calls me and I'm just like, and then I'm getting hot and I'm like, oh God, I don't even know if, if, if I'm, I'm good enough to be on the show. And I was like, oh, it's the character. Like I'm starting to think less of myself because I'm living in this character's point of view so much. So it's, uh, it can be a tricky thing. And, and, but once you kind of find it, it's really fun. So it's, it, could, could a different word for point of view mm -hmm. be like essence or personal dynamic? I think so. I think you, I think from the outside you could see it as that way, but from our standpoint as the actor, I think point of view is more internal. I think point of view is or excuse me, point of view is more external how you're seeing things. My essence is more internal to me. Um, but my but I guess my essence kind of leads to how I see things, but David can't really change David's essence because that's how the world sees him, I would assume. But David can change how he sees the world, or David can change how he sees the world through a different character. So I mean, it's like the know, filter little... between you and the world is where the point of view exists. That's amazing. I wish I could have said that initially. Yeah, we'll go back. Exactly we'll go back. Right. Yeah, 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 we'll edit that. We'll Mark, read it out, and we'll just right. give it to him. Can we actually pause. I'm so sorry. Kane, Kane is with me. Okay, so we had to take a little break, yeah. but we're back now. We are. Um, so we talked about point of view. Mm -hmm. What did you learn from Will Arnett? Um, play. Um, and also how serious he takes play and being an actor. Like the first thing that he told me was, you know, I, I wanted to be a serious actor. Like I wanted, I, I was in New York and I was, I was tired of all these sitcoms and, and I told my manager that I don't want to do them anymore. And, um, and he got arrested and his manager was like, please come do this. This is this it, like fits you so well and he was like I, i'm not no i'm not gonna do it and uh he he still approaches it from a very serious place but then once he gets on set you can tell that he's done the work and then now he's ready to play um and the work would be 100 percent off book yes and you know how you feel about yes everything, right Isn't absolutely that really what the work boils down to Absol is i can tell yes. you my emotional point of view about yes. every person every object yes that's the work 
That's the work, really putting in all that time. And the fact that he created the show, he writes the show, directs the show, produces the show, shows up, has all his lines, like and he has a lot of he has a lot of runs in his dialogue, but like he's he's so yeah, he's so good at showing up ready. And my insecurity sometimes is like, oh, am I ready? Am I ready? Because like I was saying earlier, it's like I, I, I can be a little bit reckless because I don't know. I don't know how in this point of view, how I'm going to receive what Will's going to be doing that day. Um, and that excites me. Would that, he improv? Um, sometimes he would sometimes improv. When you say play, what does that mean? Well, he 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 would he would uh, he would crack jokes and stuff like in between, and like he would do bits in between, and he would uh, he would like make us all laugh and tell these weird stories in between. But then, yeah, I guess that can be a little confusing. But then when the cameras are going, like the sense of play is no longer there, and it's now about the relationships. Um, so there wasn't really that much improv. Um, and when even so much so that oftentimes I, I, it's actually, um, you know, you, you, I went to the store yesterday instead of just saying, Oh, I went yesterday. Like they, they were pretty, pretty on me, like sticking to the line. So yeah, I, I, I learned that like he can still, cause me, like if I get corrected like that and I'm getting better at it, but like if I get corrected like that, I think, Oh God, I just screwed up. Yeah. Script like supervisor I, exactly. turns into the principal. Exactly. Exactly. Oh no, I don't want to see you coming yeah. over. That means I fucked up. Right. Exactly. And, and I'm like, Oh God. And, and they're a, always so nice, but like, so hey, nice. Hey, Dave, just, yeah. just, you can know, you just, you, uh, the, the word, we just need the word store. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. You said the shop. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. Can you please? Yeah. Thank that, you. They're Thank so you. nice. They're so nice. Do you need a water? Yeah. No, I know. I know. But in my mind, I'm just like, Oh, everybody knows that I screwed up. They had to come over to me. Now she's asking me if I want something to drink. Oh my god! Um, uh, Should I take it? Should I yeah, not? Yeah, what do yeah. think about me? Yeah, exactly. It's difficult to say. Yeah, yeah. And and I I think I think what kind of helped me relax too was like one day Will just said, "Man, I'm having trouble with this part," and I'm like, "Oh, you oh, too? good, yeah, yeah." I'm like, "Oh, that makes me feel better because like he was always so prepared. He always knew exactly what he wanted, and it was it could be a little intimidating too because like especially when he was directing an episode and it wasn't like his coverage like." He would look down at my feet and make sure that I was like on my mark or like I was getting the best light or whatever. And that would like throw me off because I'm so dependent upon the other person that I'm like, wait, why are you looking at my feet? And like now I'm just thinking like, oh, what should I reference that? Um, but yeah, he's just he's so good. He's ready. Um, and also like you do have to be able to play on set, but not I mean, obviously different sets have different uh, feels, but um, he didn't, we really didn't play that much as far as improv and stuff goes because the story was just so well written and uh, we didn't really have room to do it. What's the hardest thing for you on a set? Oh, like the practical part of acting. Um, uh, wow. The hardest thing. I guess letting go and knowing that I am ready. Letting go, you said the practical thing, and that doesn't really sound that practical, but... No, that's part of your mental preparation. Yeah, I, I, think, I think mentally for me, it is that. Practically, the waiting, I mean, it, 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 can, it, can, it can weigh on you. And then, like, or especially for me, I start questioning, okay, who's not doing their job? Like, somebody's messing up, and why is that person messing up? Why are they here? Like... You guys have, have had all this time to do all this setting up and prepping and camera work and stuff, and why are we late? And then I start I start trying to figure out whose fault it is. And the second you start thinking that someone's at fault, it means yeah. that you could be oh. at fault, too. Oh, for sure. And then the second script supervisor says, it's actually the store, not the shop. I'm like, it's me! <laughs> it was me the whole oh, time! No! I'm the one! Because for me, the hardest thing, like, you can give me a whole bunch of dialogue yeah. and like a, like an emotional yeah. scene or whatever... But you need me to midway through the scene right. walk across an entire set, yeah. land on one spot. Yeah. And like he was coming off of two actors who were over there who were talking at this volume, yeah. and to just nail the the part of yeah. film acting that's like dance. Yeah, that's the part that's hardest. For that's me. Like, tricky. Give me one place. That's so and tricky. And like work it just in this frame, and I'm fine all yeah. day. Yeah. But that's just, so tricky. That's true. Yeah, I just did that this weekend where I had to I had to fill up a water bottle in uh, no. In the middle of the scene, I had to get a burrito. I had to stab the burrito. It was too cold. I had to stab it again. It still wasn't hot enough. I had to go put it in the microwave, set the timer, have the timer go off, come back, have this conversation this whole time. And I'm like, damn, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do all that. 
Um, and it was a working microwave. So then I had to figure out, okay, wait, I can't actually turn the microwave on because then sound's going to be mad. So I have to figure out a way to block the thing that I'm pushing and hit the time button, the timer button instead of the cook button, and then set the timer for 18 seconds, not 15 seconds, because it has to ding right when I say, are you done? And then it goes ding. So that part is really hard. It's really, really hard. I, I guess... I guess it's just like memorizing your lines. Like you have to find a way to arrive at this, uh, this technical movement organically. Arrive at these technical words or these, these lines that you're saying organically. What I needed to learn, I don't know if you do this, but this was big for me, was when they say, hey, second team's coming in, first team, you can wait. Mm-hmm. Stay on that set. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no, thank you. I know, I'm going to um, stay. I'm going to keep i know you're all setting up yeah and i feel like i'm super in the way yeah but i need to practice walking yeah 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 yeah. and setting something down a bunch yeah yeah that's one of the first things i do when i get to set um because a lot of times they're not they're not shooting in the same uh set that i happen to be shooting on they're shooting a different scene you know when we get there so i'll go to where i know my scene is shooting and i'll i'll live i'll get used to that space i'll live in that world for a little bit so and even before we've even blocked it um uh, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of make some, some, some choices in my mind. I'm like, all right. Uh, so I'm rolling the joint here. I've never rolled the joint by the way. So I'm already freaking out about that. And then when I finish rolling the joint, I'm going to try to lick it on this line and then I'm going to light it and then I'm going to, I'm going to hand it over, but I got to make sure she hands it to over to me before I say this line. So what I'll do is I'll go act out the whole scene by myself. And that also gives me confidence of like, Oh, not only do I know my lines, I actually know her lines. And I sure hope that she passes that joint back to me in this place. If not, I don't know how I'm going to ask her because she's a regular on the show and I'm just a recur. So, yeah, I have to go live in the space. Do you ever watch uh, while they're setting up a monitor to get an idea of what the shot is ahead of time? Uh Uh-uh. I probably should. Um, I... I just... I guess I just have the faith that they're going to be able to cover me. And I also... Like, I'm... I don't really... Clearly, if, if if they saw what I looked like, I don't really focus on I don't really care how I look a lot of the time. So a lot of times if it's an unflattering shot or even if they're not covering me in a way that I think they should cover me, that's not my job. And so I just trust that they're going to do their job as well as I do my job. Um, I understand like I understand that if you know the shot, then it's going to make it easier. Um, but I will ask mid take. I'm like, hey, are you covering me opening the sink? Like how how wide is the frame? Like I don't need to turn the sink on if we're not getting that. Um, but yeah, I just, I don't really worry about that. I try to do it just to understand like, oh, this is the size of the frame. Mm -hmm. And that if I'm like, if I don't physically do anything here, then Mm. it's going to be empty. Mm -hmm. And so just trying to like understand what the frame that Mm -hmm. I'm playing in Mm -hmm. is sometimes activates my imagination. Oh, that's great. But other times they're like, why are you fucker why are you hovering and Mm. watching Mm. this? And I feel like you have so much more permission to do that when you're higher up on the call sheet. Mm. But so often it's those times when you're lower on there and you're like, Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure I did my job. Right. I think I, I I think I missed, I think I misunderstood. So when you, when you say kind of sitting in there hovering, do you think that like you're not being active enough that you feel like you're giving a a stale or a, or a, or a boring performance or I just, you know, I'm somebody who's had to learn the hard way. I think that, that it's a visual medium. Uh I'm a brainy dude and I come from a verbal family. And so I think for a long time, I wanted the dialogue to be enough. Oh, right. And so it was trying to do everything on there. And so the idea of like, I've got to redo this for a visual medium. I've got to figure out a way to make whatever they're looking at be interesting. And obviously it's their job to light it right. And Uh I trust them uh in that. uh It's their job to frame it right. Uh Like I'm, I'm trusting they're doing their job aces. Uh And now if I need to make sure to kind of lean back because, Oh, I'm half in light and I'm half out and that totally works for the scene. But if I'm, doing this i'm never going to use it oh, or wow or there's just like half the frame is empty over yeah here. and so it, it gives me room to physically play it just starts to make my brain start getting creative and playful in that place oh, rather wow. than thinking like i don't know how to fill this our brains are so different so different because i don't think that at all but i also know how good of an actor you are and i think that if you gave yourself the freedom to trust your instincts, and if that means that you need to move to that space, the fucking camera is going to follow you. Yeah. Um, because you are engaging. And you're, I mean, to tell the audience this, I got to work with him on an audition, and I was like, oh my gosh. Like, he, if they shoot it the way that he just did it, like, this, first of all, he's got to get this job. Like, this job is amazing. And I don't mean to, like, brag on you, but, like, 
just you putting that thing on tape, like it was so good. Like he had to hear an explosion. He had to have flashbacks. He had to go be in a counseling session. He had a ringing in his ears. Like he had to like see people who were dying. He had to see people fly across. Like it was phenomenal. And I, I think if you really trust that you can tell that story with your, with your, your, your impulses and your instincts and your thoughts and your, your, uh, imaging, you can you can let yourself move as much as you want to fucking move, and and until they say, hey, you're moving too much, or you're not moving enough, do you? What's a Ben Affleck set like? Great. I I uh, I honestly thought that uh, that it was going to be really hard, and and obviously it was my first studio movie, so I was like. Um, and, you know, Ben Affleck, he kind of carries himself with a lot of kind of uh, machismo, or I guess maybe I'm projecting that on well, him. I mean, he was a guy fully on the upswing. Oh, right? yeah, for sure. And then he'd done the town, and, like, he just, like, I, I just saw him as, like, oh, no, like, he's going to, uh, this is going to be tough. But, like, he called me in two weeks before we were shooting, and I only, I mean, I, I had two small scenes at the time. We ended, it ended up being becoming one scene in the, in, the, in the movie, but like I had two small scenes. He called me in, called me in with like 15 other guys, and he just, it was like all the White House guys, and he was like, guys, I just want you to know that I handpicked every single one of you because you guys are the people who are going to help me tell the story the best. And then right, that right there, I was like, oh, that feels so good. Like, Ben, you made me feel so good about me. Um, uh, and, and, uh, and he they was say like, that about a lot of the most famous people is they make me feel seen. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, if he was willing to do that a couple weeks, cause he's got so many other things. I mean, they're shooting in four different countries. Like they've got 80 something speaking roles. Like there's so, there's so much going on, but he had all of us come to his offices over there in Santa Monica in his, uh, we had this big boardroom and like 18 strangers. He was like, we're just going to read through like the first 25 pages of the script. If your role's in there, obviously take your role. If it's not just, um, um, we'll f- everybody just has a role. And so like, we were just reading like white house guys. Somebody was reading Cranston's part. Somebody was reading like everybody was just reading different roles and it felt like a sense of play. It felt like he really wanted us there, that we were such a big part of this movie. Um, and he was just so gracious. And I was like, Whoa, that is not the guy that I thought he was. And so when I stepped on set, like it, it was very, very similar. Like I, my scene, my scene was with, um, uh, with Kyle Chandler and Kyle Chandler, I I just I love him obviously because Friday Night Lights TV mm-hmm. show, um, and my mom watched him in early edition and that was like her favorite show in the day, um, so I I was kind of before we even shot the scene I went up and I told him hey I know you get this a lot but blah blah blah, and uh, and then he had this southern accent I was like oh are you are you where, are you from the south and like I think he's from Atlanta or maybe he's from Georgia I'm not real sure I think Georgia, um, but then we just started talking like just as human beings and it was no longer like a fan talking to like his idol like he invited me into his trailer and like we were just shooting the shit for 45 minutes and just it was so it it kind of demystified the idea of celebrity to me and the idea of like a big time actor because it's like oh we're just we're doing the same thing like you you have a bigger part and you've been doing it a little bit longer than me so I'm gonna be you someday and I'm gonna have that kid come into my trailer but um, so that was my kind of relationship with him. And then when we got on with Ben, like uh, Affleck, uh, he, you know, we did the scene or whatever. And then he comes over to me and there's like four people I want to see in the scene. And he comes over to me and immediately my brain is like, oh, no, what did I mess up? And uh, and he was like, he's like, how you doing? And I'm like, good. And in my mind, I'm like, fuck, I'm really messing this up. And he's like, I think you're doing a great job. And I'm like, oh, cool, cool, cool. You're just saying that. Um, and then he was like, how do, what, do, what do you think you'd say here? And uh, and I was like, am I not saying what's in the script? Like, what is he asking me right now? Am I screwing this up? Like, what? I could have sworn I said exactly. And uh, and I said I said something like, in the script, it was like um, to hell with this guy. And and I I think I I said I said oh, I think I just I'd say oh, fuck this guy. And he was like, let's get one with you saying fuck this guy. And I'm like, uh, okay, for real. And he's like, yeah, just fuck that guy. And I'm like, all right. And so, like, this was after we like told me to fuck that. Yeah, guy. yeah, 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 yeah. So, like, I we do the and it's a, it's a long scene. Like, we start in one room of the White House, we're walking down the hallway. Uh, uh, Kyle Chandler has this monologue. I I end up looking at a TV, walking over to his desk, talking about choreography, like doing all that. I'm hoping that I'm I'm hitting my marks, but also trusting that I am because they didn't tell me I didn't. And uh, and then when it comes to that thing, I'm just like fuck that guy. And 
And in my mind, I was like, there's no way they're going to use that. They use, It's the movie, like, fuck that guy. And then after each take, I kept saying, fuck that guy. So he, in a way, like, he just gave me, he gave me the confidence and the understanding that, like, this is a collaboration. Like, yes, I may have more experience than you, and, like, I'm the director and I'm the boss right now, but right now, like, we're creating something together. And, like, he just kind of gave me freedom to – to move in that world and, and, and live in that point of view with maybe just a little more specificity. So in a way, like that made me feel like such a great actor. Like I, in a way I was like, Oh, he just took my note. Like I said, fuck that. He's going to give me a writing. Credit, yeah. 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 He? For sure. And so, yeah, it was, it, it, he, he's really great. He's really great with his actors. And from what I've heard is like actors who become directors are really, really like they call them actors, directors. Like they're really good with their actors. And he's no exception. He's great. Got a couple more for you, but yeah. then we're going to kind of wrap up. Yeah. Um, one that I have for you is you talked about how you start by reading. Mm-hmm. You don't strike me as somebody who has the longest attention span. I, right? don't, I don't. I don't either. I don't at all. Um, how do you create and cultivate a place for you to sit down and read something that's 120 pages long yeah. and actually engage? Yeah. And like I, I have to get rid of everything. Um, I, I bought a big comfortable chair and I got I, I put in my, my own lighting system. Um, because like, I have to feel like, okay, this is, this is now my space. And for the next two hours, I'm going to watch this movie. And so I love watching movies. And so when I'm reading a script, I just have trained my brain to watch the movie. So when I start, when I start from the beginning and it's like, you know, interior, blah, blah, blah. I immediately have an image of what that house looks like or what that office looks like. And I start, and I, I, it's, it's great. I, I really don't have a, a, a long attention span, and it is challenging for me when I read boring scripts. Um, but I do, I, I have to paint the picture. Um, because, and so like how is, long does it take you to read a, let's say the screenplay is 100 pages? Uh, a solid like hour and a half, two hours. Because, I mean, I'll have to get up and get a drink of water or, you know, but I will, I'll turn off my phone. Like, I can't, I can't do any of that. Um, but I, I, if it's a feature, I set aside two hours. If it's, um, if it's a, an episodic, I'll set aside an hour. If it's a, if it's a multicam, whatever, I'll say, I, I can read this in it's half an hour. It's a discipline, though, isn't it? It is, but I'm, I'm, I lack so much discipline in every other aspect of my life that this is what I do for a living. Like, I have to be disciplined when it comes to this. And I, I am pretty much. Um, but there are some boring scripts that do take a little bit longer and I'll, you know, I'll go and do something else for an hour because, because then it takes a lot of energy to sit back down and recreate that world and be in that creative space again. Um, but I have to, I have to live in that story. I have to be able to step into it. And, um, and John made a, a good point the other day in class and, uh, I'd never heard him say this before. Uh, but he was like, uh, uh, I feel like you guys are executing the scene instead of experiencing the scene. And I'm like, Oh, that's great. That that's so smart. Because like, again, going back to like what I do intuitively is like, I allow myself to experience each scene in this movie, even if I'm not, you know, in the scene, I still like let myself experience it. When you and see the movie, do you start imagining yourself? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of times I can't, I don't know if it's my ego or whatever, but I can't watch movies that I've auditioned for and somebody else got because I'm going to be judging the fuck out of them. And the only like, time I can do it is when they're wildly different than mm. me. I've lost out a couple of parts that were not supposed to be my part to a guy we both uh, know, James Jordan. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he's, he's, you know, eight yeah. years yeah. older yeah. than me yeah. and just a wildly Very different. different type. And Very so different. those moments, I'm like, oh, show yeah. me this. Yeah, show yeah, me, yeah, yeah, show yeah. me what this like yeah. bizarro version of yeah. my life could look like right now because all of a sudden you're hitting that. It's so funny. I lost a rollout to him too. <laughs> and it was in Wind River. It was, uh, I auditioned for that one too. You did. Yeah. I, you did audition for that. I think I read that with you. Or maybe I auditioned for a different role in that. Um, but I think I read and that he's with you. So fucking yeah, good. Yeah, he is. He is. Damn we it. met on Justified. I and, still uh, remember the one yeah, we two of you were together. Yeah, it's phenomenal. He was great. Thank um, you, buddy. Last thing. This yeah. is a particular interest to me because I feel like in the next like two, three years of my life, this is going to be coming up. How has fatherhood affected your acting? Um, it's made it more important. It's made it more um, meaningful. Um, I think early on, uh, yeah. I mean, w- once he started talking. And once, like, I, we started connecting when he was, you know, a little bit older, like, and me telling him what I did for a living, and, and it just made it, yeah, it just made me want it more. 
and it made me become more disciplined. You were talking about discipline. I didn't do that early on. I didn't, I didn't set aside time for that. I, I, I didn't do as much of the work as I should have early on. And which probably explains why, you know, I'm 15 years in and like, I'm still, I still struggle with this, some of the same st- stuff that I struggled with back then. But yeah, having him and, and, um, and seeing him start to get excited about being in a play, like that's cool to me. And I'm like, man, I, I want him, I want him to see how hard I work at this stuff. And I want to teach him that it is hard work. Like, yes, you can have fun, but like you got to put in the work in order to get to the place to have fun. Um, and yeah, I just, I, I want him now that I've lost my dad, like I want him to be proud of his dad because I loved my dad so much and my dad loved me so much. And I was always hoping that if I was as good of a dad that my dad was to me, that my son would be okay. And it's actually kind of weird now because he's like 13 and 14 and he's starting to have his voice. He's starting to have this attitude and I'm like, Oh no, I've lost my baby. Um, but I, I, I want him to respect what I do and I want him to see me as, as somebody who's good at his job. I feel like life events make you take yourself more seriously. Not yeah. in I lose the fun way, but in a way that, uh, is really important yeah. to any kind of growth. Yeah. Last thing. Uh, what's, what's a movie you love? <laughs> Just like either you saw it recently, you know, just mm-hmm. something means a lot to you. It's fun. I, I, Kane, Kane is now at the age where he's starting to appreciate movies and, and we watch the whole Rocky. We'll see. Cause I come from sports. Like I, I, we watched all of Rocky together. We watched Field of Dreams. We watched, um, Rudy and it's cool seeing his movies, like his, his, some of his favorite movies becoming my favorite movies. No backwards. My favorite movies becoming his favorite movies. Um, uh, I, every time Shawshank Redemption is on, I watch it. Uh, I, I love that. Do you do anything then? Cause it's always yeah. on television. I know. I know. It, well, I don't turn the TV on that much, but w- when I see it and it's on, I watch it. I love that movie. I love Shawshank Redemption. And Kane asked me just the other day, what your favorite movie is? And I was like, man, it's weird. I'm all kind of all over the place. I love Shawshank Redemption. I love fight club and I love dumb and dumber like those. So you those like buddy movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I guess dudes, that's what it is. Dudes who love each other yeah. and cause some shit. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Same but I just, tonight. yeah, I was way off, but I loved once upon a time in Hollywood. Oh God. So fucking good. I loved you it. You should have been in that. I oh feel man. Like typewise. Oh dude. I loved just Brad Pitt. Have you be one movie. of the guys oh, in the answer? Oh, for sure. Oh, um, do you have anything to plug? Uh, coming out yeah, I guess, uh, Instagram, David Sullivan or whatever, Twitter, David Sullivan. Um, yeah, I have, uh, so I have two movies that are going to start the, like the festival uh, circuit right now. One is uh, called small town, Wisconsin. I play an alcoholic father. He loses custody of his son. He has one last weekend to make it right. And then I have another indie movie, um, called monuments, uh, that's going to start the festival thing. I just did a, a final, uh, we just did final color on that yesterday or this past week um and i have a really cool arc on goliath coming up i think that starts back in late september um and uh yeah i think i may be doing a play like i said in the beginning because i'm scared to do them and so i have an opportunity to do oleana 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 so the second i read it i I threw it down. I was like, there's no fucking way I'm doing this. Like all these words and all these, I'm listening to somebody who's not there. What? Um, That'd be awesome. Yeah. But I'm, I'm leaning into it and it's scary and it's hard. Um, But yeah, I'm looking forward to putting that up. Okay. We'll check him out on Instagram. Check out Goliath. Check out those movies. And uh, thank you so much, David Sullivan. I hope your first podcast was not a horrific experience. Oh man, it wasn't. It wasn't. Thank you. We'll see you again. All right. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you to David Sullivan for being our first guest. Uh, Please, if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the podcast. Rate it on iTunes. Tell your friends. Get them to subscribe. Follow us on social media, Industry Town Podcast for Instagram, Industry Town Pod for Twitter, also on Facebook. Tell us what you liked. Uh, And also, thank you to our presenting sponsor, John Rosenfeld Studios. We're going to be back with another episode on Thursday. But until then... Subscribe, tell your friends, give us a like, and go see a movie in a theater with somebody. I think that's a good idea. 